How many of you love the show Shark Tank? Raise your hands, hoot holler. All right, we're going to have words later. Um, how many of you want to rip your hair out every time you see the largely fictional deals, the misinformation, the misguided advice, and especially the inaccurate takeaways on Shark Tank? Hoot holler, raise your hand, thank you. Y'all are my people. Um, today we're inviting you, in light of that, to do a little escapism, to travel into kind of a parallel world that looks more like many of us wish it just would. Um, we're turning the tables. We're asking our founder, Havel, who you'll meet in a minute here, to take a seat, to relax, to tell us about his company in his own words, and then sit back and let the finance gurus that we've brought around the table um, pitch him for the opportunity to invest in his brilliant work. Does that sound good? <laughs> I hear sighs of relief. <laughs> Most importantly though, I'm trying not to take tangents, so forgive me with these notes, we're here to model what it would look like if people on stage and on TV told the truth. Today, the truth of the fact is um, there are many forms of capital, and so we're going to start with that truth. We have three forms of capital represented today. We could have had more, but the kind folks at SoCap, Chris especially, who has been my partner in crime, can, can only take so much <laughs> chaos. Um, and those three are VC, debt, and revenue-based finance. So we could have had more represented up here, but like I said, the idea is really just to send the message that there is lots of forms of capital out there, and we're going to talk about three of them. So very quickly, because they will tell us a little more when they start their pitches, I want to introduce you to the panelists, mostly because, let's be clear, Mark Cuban and Barbara Corcoran could never, okay? Please welcome our panelists, and I'll tell you a little bit about them as they come up. Havel, Val, wonderful. Thank you. Ah, thank you. We have an embarrassment of riches here. Representing VC and coming all the way from Nashville, we have Dean Newton at the far end from Majority Native Owned Relevance Ventures. Thank you for coming all the way here. This is also Dean's first SOCAP, so be nice. Uh, coming, uh, representing all forms of debt and all the way from Palo Alto in this case, not her first SOCAP, the woman who Janet Yellen looks to for advice, and the first Native American to own an investment bank on Wall Street, my president and co-founder at Known, Valerie Redhorse Mall. And last, and absolutely not least, uh, representing revenue-based finance and coming from beautiful British Columbia, specifically Whistler, by way of Mexico, and I hear maybe Switzerland? Sweden. Sweden, oh, bad, bad mistake. Uh, we have the amazing Eric Walston from Deakton Impact Alternative Finance, which many of you might know previously as Adobe Capital. So please welcome our panelists. All right, so before we get started, we really need three things from you. One of them is patience. Imagine you're in the audience of a new show that's just figuring it out, and things are going to be a little crazy, but it's all going to get fixed in the editing room. So please roll with it. Um, as the folks at SOCAP have kindly decided to do. Um, second, we want you to help Havel out. He's going to be pitched three different forms of capital, and he's going to ask them questions. If you feel like he missed something, there's something he should have asked, if you just selfishly wish that you uh, could know some piece of information from the gurus we have here, write those down and be sure that they get asked. There'll be somebody going around either taking the piece of paper with your question or also with a mic, so there'll be two ways for you to um, ask questions. There'll be a moment here for you to do that after the pitches are done, and the goal here is to walk out a little bit smarter than we came in, so please don't be shy. Get your questions ready. And then third, 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 pretend. Come join us on this ride because, of course, we know that there is such thing as blended capital. We also know that at any given time during the course of an entrepreneur's founder journey, they're going to need possibly all these forms of capital, maybe at the same time, maybe at different times in their 
um, story. And we know that when we're actually talking about which sort of capital is best and who's the winner, the truth is all three of them might be right and many other forms of capital that we could have had here on stage. So play with us. In the interest of the joy of competition, we have asked our panelists to pick a team and to defend it to the death. <laughs> and then we've asked our panelists also um, to stick with that throughout the course of the conversation. And we're asking you to do the same. And we're asking Havel to do the same and pick a team and at the end decide who's going to be the winner here. So you will have an opportunity at the end to do an audience choice. So as you're asking questions and formulating your opinions, remember we're going to ask you to pick a winner too. Um, and we're going to try not to bias you, and Havel will give us his answer after people's choice has, has uh, been shared. Does this all sound good? Those are three asks. We want patience, we want you to pretend with us, and we want you to help Havel out. Does that sound good? All right. Um, Havel, it seems like we have a deck that you'll actually be able to run us through. Um, if, there we go. Um, but first, I want to start... Tell us what is NMC Concierge, and in a world of people that are distracted with things like unicorns, why have you decided to focus on small businesses? Yeah. Thanks, Natalie, and really excited to be here. I've been, spent way too much time on the other side pitching investors, so on behalf of all the entrepreneurs, I'm trying to, I'll try to be aggressive with these folks and really get them to convince me and convince you why we should take their money. Uh, yeah, so New Majority Capital uh, is a pending B corporation, and we are focused on helping close the racial and gender wealth gap. Uh, we believe in helping entrepreneurs of color and women become business owners by acquiring existing cash flow businesses, uh, taking advantage of the silver tsunami. Uh, we don't believe in unicorn hunting. You know, I think uh, that has a very low uh, success rate. Instead, we help our entrepreneurs get into a position where they can benefit from the cash flows of an existing business, typically doing half a million to two million, so they end up maybe in the three to five million wealth generation uh, range in a five to seven year period. So, I just... Was, yeah, thank you. I was gonna say, how exactly do you support them? Yeah. Right, yeah, so we have three pillars. Uh, one is we have a 501c3 foundation that runs accelerator programs that help people of color and women understand the process of how to acquire a business, what to look for in the business, due diligence. We also help them with access to capital. That is the second pillar, which is we have a dedicated impact private equity fund that helps them acquire these businesses using a non-extractive model. And the third pillar, which I'm here to present, is NMC Concierge Services. So NMC Concierge Services essentially will provide back office support services to all these portfolio companies. And, and, and the why, now remember, they are buying existing businesses, right, from retiring owners and they're taking advantage of the silver tsunami. So a lot of these baby boomer owners haven't really invested in their businesses like you would expect them to, right? They may not have a website, they may not have a CRM system, you know, their accounting may be all over their place, their accounting is probably done by their, by their niece or nephew or wife or whoever, right? It's, they were all sorts of additional expenses to minimize taxes. They probably don't have an HR policy and don't use technology, right? I still work with so many small businesses where I've got to manually write a check and put it into the mail. So we identified this need to service our existing portfolio companies with sort of best-in-class concierge services. And so these concierge services are going to be four existing businesses that we, along with four entrepreneurs that we've identified, will acquire and then these businesses will provide these services, right? So these businesses already have cash flow. You know, we're sort of using the same model that we're helping others use. So they already have existing cash flow, they already have operations, they have people who know those particular verticals. Uh, what sort of businesses? Are we talking barbershops, pizza parlors? What, what are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about Again, half a million to two million EBITDA, so they probably have five to ten employees. They, they, you know, 
they range from landscaping companies, HVAC companies, healthcare service providers, um, small niche manufacturing companies. You know, about 10 million businesses are going to be coming up for sale over the next 10 years. So there's a whole good variety of them to choose from. And then is it the right time to ask you how you make money? Sure. Let's get there. So before we get there, just quickly, yeah. just to lay the stage. So these are the four vertical support companies that we'll have, right? And they'll be run by four CEOs um, that we've already is, identified. Can everybody see from that far? Because I, I think we've got too small of a, of a screen here. It's accounting, bookkeeping um, is the, the first one, then marketing, information technology, and then human resources, the yeah. four key. Okay. This is some more details on that. We can, we can skip this. Um, but here's, here's the money slide, right? So, so, so we are going to be, we're going to use the existing cash flows of the business to finance the acquisition of this business. So, for example, let's say it's a $2.5 million company doing half a million in net income. Typically, these companies go for a 3x valuation. So it's, if we need to buy that company, it's going to cost us $1.5 million. Now, we've already lined up SBA 7A loan debt for 80% of the financing. We already have the bank ready to go. What we need is that $300,000 to acquire this one company. The 20% down payment? Yeah, the 20% down okay. payment. And that's what I'm here to pitch these investors for. You're not pitching. I'm not pitching. <laughs> yes, that's a good reminder. Thank you. I'm always in pitch mode. Um, yeah, that's what we're sort of here to see whether these folks want to give us the money and at what terms. And if I don't like any of the terms, we'll just, we'll just walk away. <laughs> How quick that attitude switched. <laughs> yeah. And just for their benefit, I ran the numbers because I like numbers. So we looked at, you know, debt, RBF, venture. You know, what, are the, what, what is the risk return that they typically would expect? We just to give you a sense for how we're going to pay them back, right? If you start with half a million cash flow, we pay off the debt. You know, in year one, there's $224,000 and you know, so on. There's enough cash to sort of service them, regardless of what instrument they use. And there's enough of downside protection for them to get their desired return target. And the... Um Three panelists have received this, so if everybody here can't see these numbers, yeah. just trust that this is context that was provided in terms of um, what it looks like over time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the ask: 300 per company, 1.2 in total. And to give you a sense, this is our our team at New Majority Capital. So it's a mix of uh, private equity, hedge fund, small business owners, and investment bankers. Anything else that we haven't touched on in terms of things that you want us, everybody here, to know about the company and what the sort of vision was when you started it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the broad vision is to help close the racial and gender wealth gap and, you know, entrepreneurship through acquisition, which is what we're talking about here, has been kept away from people of color and women, right? They still do it at Harvard and Stanford, but they don't really... There's not a lot of people talking about this opportunity. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we, that's, that's the path we chose because it's much less risk and it's much well-defined upside as well. All right. Everybody satisfied? You have an idea of what NMC Concierge Services is? Raise your hands if you feel like you understand the business high level. Yes? Good. That's what we want. Um, we're going to now move into the pitches. The way that this will work is that um, each of our panelists will have a moment to tell us, specifically Havel and the rest of us listening in, why their form of capital is the one that Havel should choose. And then they're going to pause and Havel will have an opportunity to ask questions. We will do that first with Val, um, then we'll go into revenue-based finance, and then finally we'll end with VC. When the three of them are done, we're going to open it up for questions for you. Again, if there was something that you wish Havel had asked, if there was something selfishly that you want to know, 
um, we will give you the mic or we will read off your written questions. Please be sure that as we go through this, you are jotting down your questions and we will cover as many of them as we can. And Val drew the short straw, or actually I think was voluntold to go first. <laughs> so do you wanna kick us off, Val? Well, thank you so much. And Havel, um, I will need a chiropractor if I look at you, so I'm gonna look this way, but I am talking to you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I, as she mentioned, my name is Val. I am president uh, and one of the co-founders uh, of Known, and I have spent, prior to that, a, about 40 years, that's how old I am, in the debt markets, uh, working mostly with tribal nations. I am Cherokee Indian. And I am going to try to convince you um, that debt is the absolute best instrument. Now, if we weren't on a panel at SOCAP, what I would tell you about known is we believe an integrated capital is probably your best solution. Um, so a little bit of this and a little bit of that to be, maximize um, the founder's ability uh, to operate, but in this, particular situation, you, you can only vote for one, so I'm going to go all in on debt, and I'm going to tell um, you um, why I think debt is your best option. So with debt, I would say the number one consideration is you have no equity dilution. And um, at Known, you will notice the word own, O-W-N, is part of our name, and we believe uh, in, especially in founders of color, um, that ownership is so important. Uh, you don't want to give up equity. A lot of things, a lot of negative things can happen when you give up equity and then if things don't go the way you anticipate. So no dilution of equity. Um, one of the other things that is great about debt in most cases, especially in this case where you're looking at subordinated debt, which means it's in a lower position of priority to your senior debt, there's a lot of room for negotiation. And so what I did for most of my career on behalf of tribal clients was to come in and say, let's talk about flexible terms that work out best for both the lender and the borrower. So in this case, if you could pull up slide 10, um, I think this makes my case almost more than, than I can make, um, but slide 10 says uh, repayment of funding, and uh, Havel has already kind of penciled it out. And what we can see here is my cost of capital is the lowest cost of capital. Not only do you not dilute your equity, but your repayment, your interest, uh, or your return that you're paying to either the venture capitalist, the RBF provider, or the debt provider, um, is, is going, my cost will be by far the lowest. Now, what happens in this situation is he has penciled out a five-year term and what I would say, if I were negotiating for him with a debt provider, I would say, let's push that out a little bit so you have more manageable payments because you want an amortized note, which means you're, just like if you're paying your uh, car payment or your house payment, you're going to pay some interest and some principal. But if we push the term out beyond five years, your payments are going to be much lower, but then we'll negotiate no prepayment penalty so you can actually pay it off at any time. Um, and then the other thing that a lot of people don't think about with debt you could actually do what we call interest rate arbitrage. So basically, if you're borrowing money and you've penciled out 8%, you could create what we call a sinking fund with excess cash flow uh, and put it away to make sure you have money to pay it off when you need to. But right now in today's market, you could actually uh, get a 5% interest rate so your cost of capital ends up being about 3%. Now that gets into some you know, interesting stuff, but if you have a financial advisor to walk you through it, that would be your absolutely best option to get the lowest cost of capital. Um, the other thing I would say is a really important consideration with uh, venture and equity is often you're getting that money from what we call a closed end fund. So they, they raise a fund, and then they deploy their capital. And if you need more money, if you have some great opportunity or you hit a situation where you need more money, um, you can always come back to the lender. We would typically have a, an unlimited amount of money to lend because it's cycled money. You have a, a, a lot of assets available to lend because you're constantly being repaid and it's just a constant flow of capital. Whereas your private equity money is probably going to be done and unless they have set aside follow-on money for you, you're going to be out of luck. Um, and I would also say that um, in the debt markets, you can negotiate fixed or variable rates depending on what kind of interest rate climate you're in. And so basically, 
your options are so much greater and your cost of capital is so much lower. And I don't think we were able to get to slide 10, but basically it showed that my cost of capital over time was about 7% and the others were 15 and 38%. So the fact that you don't dilute your equity and it's the lowest cost of capital, to me, it's a no-brainer that you should go with my option. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I thought Val was going to be the softball one, but it turns out she brought she she took the gloves off. <laughs> so I, I appreciate this. How do we feel about moving on to revenue? Oh, excuse me. How do we feel about questions, Havel? Yeah. Well, thanks, Valerie. That was generous of you, I guess. <laughs> I, I like the fact that you were able to extend the term and give me some more flexibility. But you know, the, the problem with debt is I've got like this fixed debt service that I need to make to you or to your organization every year. Can you speak more about some flexibility there? Can you speak about uh, you know, debt forgiveness type options as well? You know, you're a CDFI after all, I believe, and uh, or we're assuming. And so our, our target market are the portfolio companies, yeah. but eventually we'll offer these back office services to all BIPOC and women-owned small businesses. So there's a, definitely a good impact player. We should give a little context. <laughs> uh, Val has graciously stepped in for Luz Urrutia, who I want to be sure that I name here. Luz is the CEO of the largest CDFI in the country, Axion Opportunity Fund, an amazing organization if you don't already know about them. And Luz um, caught herself a case of COVID about two days ago, and so wasn't able to come in. Val, who is not from a CDFI, but who is stepping in for the, the uh, role that Luce was going to play, um, is, is coming in to play the debt role, but maybe you could speak to both. I can speak to both. I mean, I do not head up the largest CDFI in the country like Luce does, and she's amazing, so tough uh, shoes to fill. But <clears throat> everything I just said applies. I was really talking about what I would call the capital markets, and at Known, we focus more on middle markets and not so much small business loans. But in the world of CDFIs and even SBA financing, anything that is government supported, you usually have the option to talk about everything you mentioned, even debt forgiveness. And then I would say we haven't even talked about PRIs, which would be from nonprofits, and those absolutely can talk about debt forgiveness. So it's still the best option in terms of flexibility. And then you mentioned at the beginning the fixed payment. I mean, this will always be a situation when you have what I would call regular debt, you have an amortization schedule, which is interest and principal, just like our car payments, our house payments. Um, but what I mentioned at the beginning is if you extend the term, you're going to have much more manageable payments. And what we do together is look at your business plan. You're buying a company with existing cash flow. We're going to make sure, just like when you buy a house, we're not going to overextend you. We're going to make sure you can make that payment. And if you look at the slide that got lost somewhere. Um, our payments are fixed, but towards the end of the term, they're much smaller than the requirements from the other two. So it still ends up being your best option. So we're going we're gonna to move on to revenue base. Thank you, Val, and thank you, Hagel. Uh, Eric, would you like to take us away on revenue-based finance? Sure. Um, so, Naval, the good news is we have what you're looking for. Um, I kind of feel sorry for Valerie and Dean. We might have just made them lose their time here, but I'm, I'm here to tell you about the fascinating world of revenue-based financing, uh, or RBF for short. Uh, we've been doing this now since 2010, before it was even called revenue-based financing. And so you're looking for flexibility, and that's what we provide. So the idea here is we'll provide you with a loan, $300,000, and then we'll agree on a percentage of revenue, which is going to be your payment to us. So each month, if you sell more, you pay us more, and if you sell less, you pay us less. So let's say it would be 3% of revenues. So we don't have a fixed amortization schedule like Valerie. Rather, we're in it uh, in, you know, in the ups and downs with you, and so we have a strong incentive to help you grow your business, because if we help you grow your business and you have more revenue, you pay us more and we are exiting quicker. Um, and so the way we structure this is we would uh, lend you $300,000 uh, and you would pay us back two times our money. So you would pay us back in total $600,000, but that's over time, right? And so if there's a slowdown in the economy, you know, we're in it with you. And so you're going to pay us less and, you know, your interest rate will decrease. But if we can help you be very successful, um, we're going to have 
higher payments, and we're going to have our two times money quicker. And so our interest rate uh, eventually will depend on your success. And we think that's a great alignment. And similar to debt, uh, we're non-dilutive, so you continue having your full uh, equity ownership. And that's why we think it's the best of both worlds. It's what you want, it's what you need, and that's, that's our pitch to you. I love the hushes and whispers and reactions over here. I hope those are translating into questions that you're going to ask soon. Um, Havel, thoughts? That is an okay pitch, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just kidding. <laughs> um, I like the flexibility that you mentioned, you know, it, it's, but I'm curious about your thoughts on, you know, why take a percentage of revenue versus a percentage of my net income, right? Because my net income may be zero in a particular year, and I'll have to still pay you some percentage of zero, I guess. Of I think it has to do with simplicity, right? We want to keep these loans simple. And I think we, we are both aligned that, you know, the more revenue you have, the better. But we don't want to have to be kind of like auditing your expenses, right? We, we want to make sure that you run your shop however you want. And so, you know, there could be a case here where, you know, we disagree that you're having some expenses because then you think they're maybe strategic in the long term. For us, it's like, well, then, you know, your net income goes down to zero. You don't pay us anything. So I think we're, we're misaligned there. So I think that if we're at the top line, we're always aligned. We always want the same thing. And, and we don't want to tell you how to run your business, right? You know much better of what you're doing than we do. And so if we start, you know, having an opinion on you should hire more people or less people, you know, you want to get into a bigger office, why should we have that opinion? And if it were net income, we would have that opinion, right? Because, you know, your profitability is what actually uh, triggers our repayment. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, but I don't... Like it. <laughs> well, you, another question. You, you mentioned uh, your return expectation would be 2x, and you know, I, I'm not sure what the math would be, but how would you compare your cost of capital to Valerie's? So, so that's a, a great question, and being transparent, we're going to be lower than equity and higher than debt. So we're going to be in the middle there. As I said, your interest rate will depend on, you know, revenue over time and how when we get to our 2x uh, return. Uh, but we should be in the mid-teens. Um, you know, Valerie can, you know, express she's more single digits. Um, and then uh, Dean can, can dive in. But usually equity is looking for more, you know, high 20s, 30s, right? So we should be there in the middle. Um, and we can give a you know, five to seven year uh, time horizon, and we can play with that number so that we come up with something that's comfortable for you. I mentioned we had gurus here, yes? Um, on the panelist side and also on the founder side. Good questions. Please jot down yours. I am definitely gonna call on you all if you don't. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Dean, are you ready to take us home? I am, so please pass these down. Never present to a VC unless you have a pitch deck. We can't show you ours, but we made one, and you all should have one if you're ever going to talk to us. Little tip. I didn't even know I was going to get this is This is a beautiful surprise. So, hey, well, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing us to compete for the business. I hope we will show you why we're the best partner for you long term. Uh, you've heard from the technical covenant shark. Uh, the uh, loan shark in the real sense because of the interest rates. And now I'm going to show you how we think uh, we're the orca in the room and, and we can uh, guide you to where you need to be, help guide you, I should say. So for those that can't see what it says, it's the first page says orcas and vampires. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> I, think, I think that makes someone over so, here a vampire. First, we approach this from making sure that there's an alignment in general, right? So we look at who you are and what you're trying to accomplish, who we are and what we do, and then where we think that there's a fit. And part of what we really dive into there is analyzing your business model, which you showed us. We didn't get any information other than the numbers that you showed us. So who are we? We are people who invest 
the majority of other people's money. So I've got some of my own money that I'll be giving you, but it's mostly other people's. We come with industry expertise in the sector that we're investing in. Uh, and we're expected to produce above average returns for the folks who invest um, with us. So we have bosses. Um, and just to be clear, uh, we're not Shark Tank. So Shark Tank is family office, just to be clear, well, that's not a venture capitalist. Uh, and, and we're not some of these other uh, vehicles that you might hear about, but we're going to defend them all today uh, anyway. Uh, we invest what's called smart money. So we, we bring an expertise. It's not just the capital that you're getting. We're going to be with you through it all. Uh, and so uh, sort of emphasize that, I paraphrase, we are the home of the pivot, the creators of the convertible note, the architects of the exit, and the only one you will hear from on the stage that will take your text message at 1 a.m., be at your office by 5 a.m., and stay there until your crisis is over. We're maligned as sharks by our detractors, but we're kindred spirits of the dolphin and the orca. If we become your partner, we will celebrate you during your wild ride, but if the ocean becomes threatening, we stare down the predators and we guide you to a safer shore. Who are you, based off what we've seen? You're not driven by the exit the way we are. You're driven more by social impact. But in many ways, you still want the same outcomes. You want great businesses, great founders, success. And at some point, you have to return capital to the people that gave it to you. So you're business driven. We understand you're trying to raise $300,000 for per uh, company you're buying, you're buying uh, four of them. And, and uh, just to be clear here, that is 100% financing on the acquisition of the business, which uh, is unique. <clears throat> we took a look at your model, and you shouldn't feel bad about this because we found some things that you know, we question. Everyone who gives us a model, we question a little bit. Right, what's wrong with the model? I'll tell you, no one's ever given us a financial model that 100% added up, right? So we noticed a few things. Uh, one is you're assuming no attrition in your model and 100% uh, growth year over year, right? And the same amount of money uh, from each one in terms of spend, but no customer acquisition costs. Now I understand now how that works, right? Because you've got a captive audience, but you've still got an existing customer base you have to satisfy, so you're competing for their business. Uh, the other thing is you're buying these businesses at 3x. So the market exit cap rate for these businesses is somewhere between 8 to 12x. So it indicates to us that there's something about the businesses themselves that you're buying that needs some help. Maybe they need investment, maybe they need architecture, they need infrastructure, I don't know. But there's something about those businesses that's artificially devaluing them uh, that allows you to buy them for 3x. We also notice in your EBITDA calculation, you don't have any technology, you don't have any infrastructure, te te technology, or other investment capitalized. So that would normally come after the EBITDA number, right? We would see that. So that suggests you're not investing in tech. <clears throat> so we would have some concerns about those data points. Oh, and one last point. You won't get a second uh, uh, lender. This is called a second. Some people call it mezzanine, uh, depending on the status. But you're not going to get it for 8%. You're, if it's a 15% deal, uh, 14%, maybe 13%. Okay, Parapasu, Parapasu, okay, <laughs> right, right. Pay attention, what I said, the shark of the technical covenant. I'll explain what that means in a second. <laughs> in <laughs> she, case anyone was wondering I mean. who was being called the shark, uh, now we know. Right, 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 right. So, 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 not, so we have some concerns about that model, right? So what we do is we do three analysis. What's the best case outcome, the worst case outcome, and some adjustments we think are fair. So let's go to the worst case outcome. Right? Let's assume things go badly. Uh, your existing customer base starts to erode. You are not as successful raising money for follow-on investments the way you're planning, and so you can't keep the deal flow coming in that you're projecting in your model. Something changes in the economy. You can no longer staff these companies with the, the people that they need. That could be because the economy is great, you can't hire the people, right? In that situation, you've not invested in your tech, so you can't scale. Uh, worst case scenario, something's just failing about the model in general, and these numbers are not producing. You're going actually in a negative growth pattern. In that situation, let me tell you what would happen. He's never going to make the deal, right? He's never going to promise you that deal's even available. You will be in breach before you go negative with, this, with a conventional lender because you've breached their technical covenants, which means 
you're in breach even if you're paying them. They don't tell you that up front. I'm the only one you'll still have to deal with who's trying to turn the business around. Now, what was really interesting about the analysis that we concluded was we looked at the economic models of the best case and the worst case scenario. And amazingly, the numbers were almost the same. And you think to yourself, Dean, how can that be? I'm losing my ass. <laughs> well, the point is, the numbers are almost the same. There are two fact patterns, at least, that we came to where we thought might be interesting uh, to you. One is, there's an enormous data play. If you invest more heavily in the tech here and build out a real platform, which you cannot do with other one of these models because you know, there's no cash. If you're, you cannot take the, that cash and invest. You're giving it to the sharks. You're going to get an enormous data play. We have a portfolio company that's in a very similar fact pattern to yours, has, is doing a deal right now at a $200 million pre. That is enormous growth, right? Because they invested in tech and they had data they could get, sell for enormous amounts of money. Very valuable. But that's not what we're talking about, is it? Because that doesn't get you the same numbers that is worst case. The, worst, the, the best case scenario has something that we thought might be interesting, might not. These are startup companies, right? <clears throat> You might want to give them the services for free, and they might take a little bit less in terms of being best in class if you took more stock from them. In that situation, you don't have the cash, right? You need that cash. You know you need to be able to forego it to take the equity. Now, if they start to have exits, the world's grand. Now, I know it doesn't perfectly fit the fact pattern, but I invite you to consider this. If you know, and very few founders do, on day one, where your business is going, 100% of the numbers, everything is 100% guaranteed, you don't have to worry about investing in anything, you don't have to go get customers, it's just going to fall down from heaven, they're your best deal. But as a founder, as, as starting out floating this on day one, you really can never have a crystal ball. So I in exchange for my investment, which is only 16.7%, by the way, of your cap table. I'm the one who will take that gamble. I'm the one who will invest in the ride. And when it's not working, I will show up to help you. I hope I've earned your business. I hope you'll at least consider it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> VC came out of nowhere and surprised me. We went a little long, which just means we're going to give you time for one question, and then we want to make sure that there's time for audience questions. So is that okay, Havel? Um, sure. Yeah. There's a lot you threw at us. Yeah. I didn't, I I didn't want to interrupt. That's you know, he, Dean that was in the flow. Representative of the asset class, I guess. You know, they're chasing unicorns, and you know, they want to take a large portion of your company before scaring you. <laughs> um, by the way, am I paying for this if I take your money? No. It's no, all, okay. It's all free. <laughs> all right. It's all free. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, that your question? No. Oh, that was just the preamble <laughs> content. Okay. Yeah. So, do you have any uh, exit scenarios for us that uh, that could be based on you know giving you some multiple of your money back? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Do you have an exit scenario for us where we give you a certain multiple of your money back? Or do you want to hold on to us forever? Because, you know, we are not trying to create a unicorn here. We are trying to create, let's call it a zebra. We also want to create something that outlasts us and, you know, goes into perpetuity. So we normally have a five to seven year time horizon. If that is too short for you, there are ways we can engineer exits uh, with, that aren't exits. So it can be through secondary. We can be bought out. There are ways we can negotiate that into the deal. Amazing. I know that Havel probably has more questions, but we want to prioritize yours. So, um, Chris and the team, um, Casey, how do we want to handle this? And who, amazing, who has questions that you want to ask any of the panelists, debt, revenue-based, VC? Please raise your hand or so the, hand us a piece of paper, whatever works for you. There's a mic back there. I have a mic in front. We'll take a question in the front, a question in the back. So Don't raise your hand. Don't You have a question. Yes, yellow, beautiful cardigan. 
Hi. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all this information. My first company was in fintech as well, so this was very helpful. Um, I have a question for Valerie. I loved your pitch with Known. And what I, I'm from Stanford as well, by the way. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you only invest in the US or in other geographies as well? You're asking about Known or is she asking about Known? <clears throat> Um, right now, we are only investing in the U.S., but I believe, you could jump in here, I believe our business model is to include other countries, and in my past life, when I worked with tribes, I did both U.S. and Canada because of the tribal nations in Canada, but our um, ownership at Known is very um, diverse. Natalie herself is uh, Ecuadorian and Colombian, so my guess is we will be expanding into other markets um, in the near future. <laughs> we could definitely talk about no and offline. Any questions for the panelists related to this? We've got, ooh, good. Now we, start, now we have a bunch of hands popping up. Whoever we can get the mic to first wins. Sorry, proximity in this case wins. Yay, I won. Cool. Um, yeah, question for all the panelists, really, but just kind of see. I'm interested, if I was sitting in Havel's position, which of you would play well if you did with others? Like, for example, mm -hmm. would you be able to take on, if a company had some debt, how would you feel about it if you're in the revenue-based you know, financing space or if you're taking the asset piece in? So I'm kind of curious, like, who would play well with whom um, up on the panel if you were to have that? And very much sort of thinking from the panel of adding debt or if you've already got someone taking a, a royalty off the top. You know, you guys get the question. Thank you. And before you answer, I would just say, for those of you that are next, that, this is the kind of question we also want. We want you to help Havel make his Please decision. Please help me. Yes. I will, I will jump in. If, I think everyone heard the question, who plays the best with each other? So could you work together uh, theoretically? In my opinion, you could have equity coming from venture capital and then layer debt, obviously, on top of it and have a blended situation. Neither one of us like revenue-based financing in this scenario because he's taking a piece off the gross, not the net, and we're basing a lot on that number, and so we would probably prefer to do a, an equity and a debt play and not have the revenue-based financing in there. Eric, thoughts? And in our defense from the vampires here, um, you know, we, we're a substitute for debt and equity. That's why they don't like us. We make them a bit irrelevant and obsolete. And so we're, we're, we're willing to give you more money so you don't have to deal with either of these. I love this. Who's next? Stir the Hi. pot, folks. Hi there. Um, I'm Allison Kelly with ICA Fund. Uh, great panel. There's like fighting words up here. Um, <laughs> love the financing options that you're all offering, but we also know that a business owner like Havel needs capacity building, and not just when there's a fire to be put out in the middle of the night, but how are you going to help him navigate the anticipated challenges and needs that his business is going to have since you, you know, theoretically have enormous networks that could support him? How are you going to do that? Very short from each, please. Well, let me help you. They're not. Uh, so <laughs> we are the only folks that will show up to do that, and we do it extensively. I will tell you, I've been complaining about it. I am 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 75% of that is uh, working for our portfolio companies, trying to get them uh, whatever it is that they need, helping them think through things, business plans, and, and so forth. So um, go ahead. I'd love to hear your answer. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so, again, we're kind of in the middle. Um, we will sit on your board. We'll help you grow the company, but we're not going to tell you what to do, right? I, I, I cannot tell you what your churn is going to be and what your attrition is going to be, and I don't want to tell you how much to invest in IT. You're the expert here, and you're on the driver's seat. I'm going to go off topic a little bit because what we do at Known, we're in an intermediary, so we're going to act as an investment bank or a financial advisor, and honestly, that you want a trusted advisor who is placing any of this capital to really be able to work with you on the best capital and then stay with you. Um, to his point, as a lender, we typically would not require a board seat, but sometimes that can be overreaching. So you kind of want a lender that's your friend but doesn't get in the way of your business. So I would always recommend a trusted financial advisor to really get to the truth of the three different scenarios. I expected Nashville to take the gloves off, but Sweden, I'm impressed. This is, this is getting really good. Who's next? We've got, I know we had a lot of hands 
Okay, great. Hi, thanks. I think my question is about the cost of capital because I was very clear from Eric that it's the valuation is 2x and it's a 3% off of the profit or the, the revenue. Um, but I, I, and maybe uh, Val, this is the, the slide that you couldn't show us, but I, I don't think I heard you say what the interest rate was and is it also a $300,000 loan? And I guess then the question for you, Dean, I, I don't exactly understand the 16.7% and, and how that plays out and what that looks like over the cost, the five to seven years. It was a little hard to hear, but you're yeah. asking about the returns. Yeah, is that correct? Okay, so yes, the slide that um, couldn't be pulled up for some reason show that mine's pretty straightforward. You're going to know the interest rate. It doesn't change. Um, on revenue-based financing, so it's... I'm sorry. It, I'm just going to... I'll try to speak up. Is this better? Uh, I actually... I understand how it works, at least on the revenue-based financing. What I was just curious about was the actual interest rate that you'd be talking about. Um, it, you said you would be willing to move it from five to seven years out longer than that, and I'm curious, let's assume that we're talking about $300,000 loan, what interest rate you would be willing in this interesting moment of inflation and the increased, you know, like, what is your interest rate that you'd be offering me? Have a, Are you asking me or the revenue base? You. Oh, okay. Um, so in, in today's market, there are high interest rates, and so most lenders uh, depending on if I'm coming as a CDFI or a bank, depending on the, on the entity that I'm representing, what I would do in this case, and I, I mentioned it to the, the shark at the end, the venture capitalist who said, you know, if I'm subordinated debt, my rate needs to be higher, I would probably negotiate peri parsu with your senior debt so that we're at the same position so that I can give you the lowest rate possible. And you know, right now they modeled, I didn't do this, they modeled um, my debt at 8%. And to Dean's point, that would not be the correct rate for subordinated debt, but it might be correct for senior debt. And then if you're going to a CDFI or any other entity that's sort of a lender in our space, you're going to get even a lower rate. So maybe it, it becomes 5 to 7%. And again, it's all a negotiation depending on your business model and who I'm representing, what money I'm representing. Got it. Thank you. And then I think that I understand how, Eric, you work because you were pretty clear. But the companion question for Dean was, you said 16.7%. And I'm just curious how that ends up playing out and over the course of the five to seven years. Well, so the 16.7 percent is not an interest rate. It's an, the percentage of the company we would own based off the uh, 1.2 million that they're asking for in, in aggregate. So we would be in the cap table. There is no interest rate on that. Amazing. Great questions. Looks like we've got another one here. And just for those passing the mic next, there's somebody with his hand over here as well. Yeah. How you doing? My name is Eric. Um, first off, thank you so much for your pitches. Really uh, interested in learning a little bit more. But I do have a question for you before I actually take the time to, you know, listen to your pitches a little bit more. I'm actually interested in your portfolio. What is your actual percentages of BIPOC founders within your portfolio? I love that question. And for me, it's 100%. And there's, and there's another uh, question after that. Okay. I'm sorry, what? So for each, is that true? Yes, for, for each. For all three. Percentage BIPOC in your portfolio. Percentage what? For percentage BIPOC owned or led, is that correct? BIPOC owned businesses in your portfolio. Okay, so, so we invest in Latin America, so it's a very high percentage. This is my favorite question so far, I have to say. Now, this, you're talking about our fund, right? Not in general. 60% uh, of our portfolio companies have a, a female or person of color as a founder or co-founder at the cap table, and we did that organically. And what was that last part? We did it organically, meaning... Yeah. It... I, I, I want to add something. This is a great question. Um, we would actually, in real life, support that venture capital coming into your company as a native-owned fund because what we're trying to see is your equity owners staying in BIPOC in the communities of color as we scale. So a native fund investing in your company would be something that we, we like, um, but you have to be careful with sort of more traditional funds that, you know, out on uh, what's the Sand Hill Road, you know, in, in Palo Alto might not be the right fit. Did, do, in the second part, yeah, please. what are the actionable items to increase that percentage for from 60% of female, BIPOC female-led, to maybe adding an additional percentage for 
black-owned, male-led startups? What, so are you, are you asking me if we're disproportionately carrying the number up because we were adding women in? Is that what the... No, no, just, just increasing, increasing that percentage. Well, so what's interesting about this, about the question, I don't want to take too long answering it, but um, we came at investing without any preset notion of percentages or any of that kind of thing. Uh, and so when all of this uh, discussion came to the forefront about DEI and, and, and impact investing and all these things, we said, well, we should probably run some numbers. And, and so we did. And the six, that's where we saw the 60%. And frankly, even we were shocked, right? We outperformed pretty much any venture capitalist I'm aware of. Um, that's a good thing. Where did we underperform grossly in Native Americans? How weird and messed up is that, right? Not Wait, that's one, where you underperformed? Not underperformed. There's not one Native American in our uh, portfolio that was Native American founded. Uh, we're doing stuff about that. I, I can get a whole another conversation about how we're some uh, Val knows some of this. We're launching a non nonprofit that's going to target on this very issue. But um, I don't. I probably didn't answer your question. Uh, black male? Did I get there? You, what? Oh, I can tell you what we're doing in the Native American space. We've not targeted uh, the black male space. We're having a conversation with you uh, about that. In the Native American space, we're launching a nonprofit that is really meant to be a clearinghouse to get this information where it needs to be. Who are the VCs that you should be talking to? What do you need to present to them? What sectors are they in? Why should you trust them? Uh, that's coming. It's coming quickly. We've done a lot of work on it. Um, so we don't have the answer yet, but we're devoting a shit ton of time to it. But the answer is pay attention and take actual action, not, not sort of wait. Um, Just wanting to also remember that we're trying to get Havel a really good deal here. Yes. So any other questions, questions that can help Questions that him? will help Havel make his decision, that will give him information that will allow him in a few minutes here to deliberate and make his final call. Uh, perfect. Thank you. My name's John. Uh, I've had experience with VCs who were super excited by us, and then uh, we were struggling and uh, stopped talking to us, which might have been good or might not have been good. And I'm curious... Um, Eric, you mentioned interest rates possibly changing. What happens when we're not doing as well as you thought? What is the consequence? How do you react? What do we have to be prepared for? You know, does our company still exist when we're not doing as great as you hoped? Is that for all of us? Yeah, for all of you. Okay, so he made a comment that I was covenant strict or something. The whole idea of debt uh, from a CDFI who was supposed to be here is that it is builder capital or friendly capital that you can negotiate longer terms, you can negotiate flexibility if something goes wrong. What he's referring to is if you just went to a large bank, you would have covenants that said if you fell below a certain revenue, you go into default and then we start making you put money aside or we, we start doing things. So I'm not representing extractive capital. Um, so normally with a CDFI or any other community type of loan, you're going to be able to have workout covenants as opposed to just entering into default. So there'd be a way to negotiate a longer term or a lower payment for a, a period of time or even a drop in interest rate for a period of time until you get back on your feet. And that's something I did a lot with tribal nations. Um, in our case, it's just baked into the model. Right, you're gonna pay us 3% of revenues. So if your revenues go down by half, you're gonna pay us half. If there's a month which is terrible and you don't have revenues, you don't pay us at all, right? So we don't have to concede, we don't have to stretch, we don't have to give you, it's, it, that's just natural. Until we get our two times our money, we're with you in the long term. So I'm sorry you had that experience, first of all. Uh, I've heard the story often recently for some reason of VCs investing and they, they vanish when things go wrong. I don't know who those people are, but the Orca actually is an interesting metaphor here because I can tell you what I can do to them. I can come in, I can recap your company, I can cram them out of your cap table and I'll make sure that they go away. And I can lead that as a round and I can give you stock back in the company so you still own a big hunk of it and you're incentivized to go forward. I can do that. I can do that to them and I will. You tell me who they are. <laughs> All right, I guess you know who you're talking to after this. We are, we, I know you have great questions. I've been incredibly impressed. I hope, Havel, you found um, many of them helpful, especially the insight that came out of them. 
We are going to deliberate, and we're going to do it out loud. Um, I'm going to ask Abel what his thoughts are. Um, he is not going to give us the answer. We don't want to bias you, but we want to get into his head a little bit and just have a short conversation to get some of his thoughts now that he's heard, thanks to you, as much as he has. And then we're going to pause. When we are done deliberating for a moment, we're going to do audience choice. So if you've already decided which you would choose of the three and who you would crown the winner here, um, then great. But if you want to hear out some of Havel's thinking, maybe that'll help you make your decision. So that's what's next. Havel, where's your head? Not the answer, but thoughts. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they, they all made strong arguments. And um, I haven't obviously, I haven't made up my mind yet. So I'm game waiting time, to see what the audience decision. thinks as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm looking at three buckets to make my decision. You know, one is, you know, the financials, right? Can I, I'm an impact, I'm in the impact space and I want to be responsible with the capital I get. So I want to make sure I can pay back these folks who then have to pay back their LP investors or other stakeholders that they have money from. The second is, you know, are they going to be a true partner? You know, so what else are they bringing in besides money? And the third is, you know, how flexible can they be? Um, so let me go to the second piece on the partnership piece. If you could talk more about what else you can do besides money. I think Alison brought up something around technical resources, and I'm curious about... Do you want to ask an additional else. question? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll allow that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And then we'll do a little more deliberation sure. and then let the audience yeah. influence us. As a lender, we do not uh, require a seat on your board, but we will be a partner, so we will definitely have resources. And again, depending on who the lender is, I represent a lot of different types of lenders, um, there would be resources available. We, would, we want you to succeed, and so we would come alongside you and help you make business decisions and bring other resources that might be helpful to you so that you can, in fact, make your payment to us, which is ultimately what we both want. Um, in our case, we have a lot of investors who have uh, technical assistance grants, and so we'll help you identify the ones you need and the ones who can be most catalytic to your business, and that is just part of our service. I hope somewhat through some exaggeration in entertainment, uh, I've demonstrated that we're the correct partner for you. What you've heard from the first two is that they're not going, they're, all they talk about is how they're not going to be involved. We're not going to be on your board. We're not going to tell you about your IT. We're not going to do this. We're just going to take our money as we're promised. I am going to be involved. We're going to be there for you when the chips are up, and more importantly, when the chips are down. And I understand if this were an ongoing business where you could get a lot of predictions and models and all that kind of thing, it's not as a startup, and that's very important. We're here for you. Hey, well, any final thoughts on your part in terms of just where your head is? The three things you're looking at, again, are how people partner with you. What else? How, flex how, how flexible, flexible they are. Okay. And then, you know, as a responsible, impact-oriented firm, can we give their money back with the terms that they're looking for? Are you going to be able to return yeah. what needs to be returned? Okay. Any other thoughts? Considerations? Ob observations? Impressed? Not impressed? I'm impressed that they really did their homework, which is good. Um, yeah. No, no, no other thoughts. Okay. All right. Are you ready for audience choice? Got a bunch of opinionated people in the audience, I think. How are we going to do this? So I think that for ease, we will have hands raised and we'll do a quick tally. So we can go person, well, capital by capital, and we can do a, a raise. All right. All right. <laughs> So, if we think, I might ask our volunteer also to help us count, just to make sure. Um, so, yeah, if it's hard to count, we might need noise and hands. Oh, okay. I don't know. Noise and hand. Yeah, <laughs> let's get this noisy in here. So, I think, so if we think that Havel should take um, Valerie's deal from Known Capital, let's see your hands and let's debt. hear you. Debt. Who votes for debt? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Woohoo! Yes. Pretty overwhelming. Okay. okay. I shouldn't add to the noise. Yeah. If, if we think that he should be taking a deal from Eric, let's see your hands. And let's Come hear on. you. This is, the, this is also a quiet crew. You're Such a quiet room. 
And then finally, if we think that he should be taking a deal from uh, Dean, let's see your hands and hear you. Venture capital. All right. Last <laughs> visit. Wait on, I have to make the decision. Oh, yeah. I, wish, I, want the room. I wish you knew how competitive Val was. You just made her month. And for those of us that have to work with her, we're never going to hear the end of this one. <laughs> so thank you. All right. So what we were, want to know from you, Havel, is not just what you've chosen, whether the bias and the influence from the audience helped make your decision, but also why. Let us know. Yeah. Should we do a drum roll? Should we do something? <laughs> all right. Let's do it. Wow. I really like all three of you. Let me start by saying that. <laughs> now he gets nice. <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was looking for, you know, as I said, flexibility, partnership, and, and our ability to pay back our investors, you know, with the reasonable cost of capital. And we've, I've decided that I'm going to go with Valerie. What? <laughs> the winner. Oh, you've made her year. Yay. And you know I'm the stand-in today, so that is really special. Thank you. <laughs> and now are we going to do the term sheets? <laughs> are we going straight into that? Um, what we definitely want, and I think this is where we need you to take it away, is just how was this? This is our first time experimenting with this format. Did it work? 